Excessive materialism and militarism. We know full well that racism is still that hound of hell. I never watched, I was like a super huge OC fan, so I feel like they kind of came together. They like kind of, they clashed. Clashed, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was like super yeah. into OC, and it's I was not into Gossip a shame, Pro. I would have invited you to Gossip Girl Trivia. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> We're I, hosting one. I'm like thinking about what I would present, and I think... <laughs> what would you present? I don't know. Well, Taylor Swift has been taken. Well, one, I would make a case for why I should be in her squad. Because <laughs> yeah. I want to get invited to those cool parties that she's always Instagramming. And I'm like, that sounds like fun. And I feel like I'd be like her voice of reason. I'd be like, stop dating that guy. He sounds awful. Right away. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or I'd be how, like, like, date yourself. Yeah. <laughs> You know how, like, in Scandal, they have B613? What's the Scandal? Like, the show. With... Oh, the show Scandal. Yeah. B613. No, I don't know. Yeah, want. they have, Sorry. like, a secret CIA operative that's, mm -hmm. like, all assassins. Oh. But, like, they funnel money little by little from every department of the government. And I feel like if I were Taylor Swift's best friend, I would, like, funnel a little bit of everything from her projects and give it to, like, POCs. <laughs> Wow, that's a better. Yeah, I was just like, I'm just here for the party <laughs> and <laughs> like, to give you some I'm advice. To give you some dating advice. <laughs> I'm on some like next level Robin Hood shit. Yeah, <laughs> that's like way better. That's a better presentation. <laughs> you should do that presentation. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. that would be a really good presentation. Yes, please do it. How to spend two million dollars of Taylor Swift's money. <laughs> If you get into a squad first and then, yeah. like, funnel that. Well, if she's listening to this, Taylor, what up? What we'll up, be Taylor? your friend. We live in New York. We're cool. <laughs> <laughs> we'll sing karaoke. Um, but today I'm joined by, <laughs> with that great opening, Welcome to Now in Color, the podcast that brings those who have been erased from history back to the forefront. I'm your host, Sandy Chang, and today I'm joined by Beatrice K. Hi. Hello. Beatrice is a queer Filipino-American poet, writer, creative director, and community organizer. She runs a book club for women and femmes of color in bed where we create safe spaces to discuss intersectional feminism and gentrification. She also writes and creates images for a blog for smart stoner girls called Two Girls, One Coven. Her community work, writing, and poetry all culminate in an unapologetic celebration of fatness, queerness, brownness, foreignness, and intersectionality. Welcome, Beatrice. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. What a what a great bio. I should know I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful bio. <laughs> um, yeah, I first heard about the book club actually through a sticker that I'm assuming yeah, you put up. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Off the Gates Avenue, J Train. <laughs> and that's Yay. all I'll say because <laughs> I'm scared of murderers. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and that I feel like the book club kind of blew up from there um yeah I think so um when you know when I really was like actually around this time last year I was really looking for community um and I was like how can I contribute to bed in a way that's still like authentic to me so um yeah it really started off with those like tear off flyers with like my number on them and Your then personal my number. personal phone number, okay? <laughs> and I was like, text me if you're interested in this. And like like 30 or 40 people started like texting me being like, yeah, we're so interested. And I was like telling my sister about it on the phone. And she was like, so like you're telling me hundreds of strangers have your phone number. Like maybe that's not the safest. And I was like, you know, you're right. So I, you know, put up an Instagram so that people can communicate on there. Also like the group text situation between everybody, it was like, five people were androids and like we couldn't get on one like solid group chat so oh my i was God, like yeah. okay let's communicate online it's fine and yeah that's amazing and what led you to moving to bed -Stuy? were you always in bed -Stuy? i was not i moved here um 2015 <laughs> um Yay. so it's been a little minute um and you know 
when I was like couch surfing on friends' houses, like I, a friend of mine lived in the area, and I when I started looking, I was like, I'm going to limit it to this area. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the places I started going to when I was like couch surfing was Manny's on Patchen Patchen Avenue. Um, yeah, I don't yes, know if I... it's like street or anything, <laughs> but. Yeah, and I was like, oh, it's really cozy in here, and, like, all, everyone seems to know each other, like, this is dope, and I was like, I'm going to limit my search to, like, this exact neighborhood, Mm -hmm. (laughs) so, yeah. Yeah, our neighborhood, um, so, we also live very close to each other, we live across the street from each other. And we never knew. And we never knew until we met at a cafe near us, Chez Alex, I guess I can give them a shout out. Yeah. Can't murder me there, it's public. (laughs) (laughs) Um... Yeah, and, like, we live literally across the street from each other. But I will yeah. say our neighborhood is so – it has just, like, such a community feel to it. And for everyone sure. is so kind, at least except for one person who I think we both know who it is. Yeah. The guy <laughs> in the big building. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think everyone is, like, looking out for each other. Like, even when I first moved there um, – Seven years ago with my little Pomeranian people were like, yeah. where were you? Like if I like go on vacation or yeah. something, they'd be like, are you okay? I, we thought you died. <laughs> so that's like really nice to have yeah. someone sort of like look out for you when yeah. you're alone in New York because it's such an isolating. It can be such an isolating feeling here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, also to not give away too much about our exact location, there is a shop maybe like a couple doors down from me um shout out clem and hollis (laughs) so these two guys like say good morning to me every morning for almost like the last four years or so and like one day i started to walk on your side of the street Mm -hmm. because there was you know a cat collar from yes kind of that construction site and they like as I was crossing the street one day, they were like, hey, like, what's wrong? Is somebody, like, bothering you? And I was like, oh, oh my God, that's so nice. That is so nice. Yeah, like, they really, like, took a minute to, like, check in on me. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> yes. So nice. So precious. Yeah. And it's so great that, like, from this already, there's a community there that you yeah, created. This for sure. new community for women of color. Yeah. yeah. And how has that <clears throat> been? Like, what are some things you've learn from it's been a year right it's been a year which is so wild like I was just looking through um our old posts and I was like wow the first like book club meeting was like on April 18th which is also my little sister's birthday so I was like wow like that's so wild and it's really been a year and it's been life-changing honestly yeah really good yeah what are some things that you've really taken away from it that you didn't think would occur Um, there's definitely a greater sense of purpose. Um, when I first started to really build the book club community, I was like working at this job that wasn't amazing. (laughs) And, you know, and there was a lot of, I mean, there was not a ton of work-life balance in that position. Plus there was a lot of just like really dramatic things that happened when I was like trying to leave that job. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think like, once I finally had this solid community, I was like, you know, n- none of this, none of the, um, what is it, like corporate ladder climbing, like none of that stuff really matters or is like important to me. Like um, it really sort of like reshifted my view on what I should be pursuing um, in terms of like feeling wholeness in my life. So honestly, like to me, it's been really life changing. Yeah, that's so beautiful. I I completely relate to that getting out of the corporate life and finding purpose that may not have monetary capitalistic gain to it. And I think even just discovering that is so, it can be like such a lonely experience, but then it's so fulfilling at the end because you're coming, at least for me, I was coming from a place where everyone was living that corporate ladder climbing life and so when I left they were like what like what the fuck yeah what are you gonna do now and even you know I was in like a startup setting so even then it was less about here are like the physical like rungs of the lat is it rungs yeah I think so yeah like it's like here are the physical like rungs of the ladder it was more like here's how we're gonna turn money around like quick and here are the strategies so that we can like 
really cash in on this trend or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember like International Women's Day, they would make all of the <laughs> women employees like pose and they're like, this is for Women's Day. And I'm like, listen, I don't, you're not <laughs> doing shit for Women's Day. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, I know you don't give a fuck about Women's Day other than your clicks and your purchases. Like, come on. Like, it became very like transparent to me that they really were just like operating from this like autonomous like search for money and I was like I'm not interested in that anymore and I feel like having a community that like would affirm that the work I'm still doing is important was like it made it easier for me to be like okay I'm gonna leave that alone yeah so yeah in your book club um have you ever found like you know speaking about like corporate wokeness I guess is that (laughs) I don't even know I feel like woke being woke now is like very trendy it's like the cool thing to do how do you grapple with that um, in your personal experience with the book club which is like it's pretty woke and radical (laughs) not to insult (laughs) yeah because woke sounds like an insult now but I'm like you know it's like a very progressive and radical book club which I really appreciate thank you thank you um (laughs) no I mean I feel like how do I how do I say this in a way that's like diplomatic? Um, you don't have to be, unless <laughs> someone is about to listen. Like, what the fuck, Beatrice? I don't want to make any enemies. Yeah, except <laughs> unless they're white, then yeah, I'll, I'll fight. <laughs> unless they're male, yes. like yeah, okay, I'll fight. Yeah, um, exactly. Like no, that. I mean, I feel like um, through book club, there have been people who like have wanted to reach out and do collaborations or. Like, I've reached out to some folks and said, like, said, you know, can we work together? Can we, like, you know, help spread a good message? Um, And it became very evident to me that, like, when someone says to me, like, oh, I don't know, I'm, like, interested in a follow count or, like, whatever, I'm like, okay, you're not doing the work, you know? Like, Mm -hmm. I think it's less about, like, like, I, like, I was in conversation with somebody and I told them, like, it's important that for someone who is like leading an organization to be concerned with community and not clout. (laughs) Like I don't really clout is also like a, a buzzword right now. I feel like, I don't know. I feel, I feel like, um, just like, I'm so sorry. I don't even remember your original question. No, it's okay. (laughs) I'm, um, I was saying, how do you grapple with like this trend of wokeness? Um, yeah, I think community. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, becoming easy to weed out like people's intentions if it's like you know anytime we're working on a project or anytime someone's coming into the space to say something that's like I'm, people aren't usually like combative I feel but if anyone is like it's easy to kind of identify like what like where they're coming from mm-hmm. um, and it's usually like yeah I'm trying to sell you something <laughs> or like oh we're trying to sell your follower or something and I'm like yeah. very not interested in that yeah um, yeah yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, but did you see, like, I <laughs> I posted a couple of weeks ago that there was a meme that was, like, this rat holding a pizza. Yes, I saw like, that. I loved it. And it was, like, me at Radical, <laughs> Radical Book Club and then, like, the copy I bought on Amazon. It is like, so true. Yeah. I, I definitely like that. And I think I even shared it on <laughs> Now in Colors um, handle because, like, yeah, I definitely – I definitely buy yeah. from Amazon. I'm just like, no, I mean, it's hard. hard. Like, I yeah. think, you know, there's a tightrope that we're walking now between like our ethics and what we can actually afford as like millennials. And it's like, it's just really funny to me. Like, it's, <laughs> it's like, it's kind of tragic. Like, one of the things that I think about all the time is like, you know, when I was growing up, I used to visit my cousins who live in Queens. I grew up in the Philippines. I used to visit my cousins who live in Queens and they lived around the corner from a McDonald's. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so like, when I got older, I was like, oh, man, like if I live close to a McDonald's, that means I made it like I'm like I'm I got it. I got it going on. I'm financially stable. I live close to McDonald's. Like, yeah, that's like my security blanket. But now, like as an adult, I'm like McDonald's, like low key ruined the world. <laughs> like, yes. you know, like, <laughs> fuck. Um, so when did you um, move from the Philippines to here in the States? Yeah, I was 13. Mm-hmm. Um, first, we moved to we really stayed in Delaware. Um, my dad lived in Jersey City at first, which is like, I remember going there and being like, aren't there like white people in America? Like it was all Filipinos in mm-hmm. Jersey City, I feel like. So, yeah. W- was there any huge culture shock that you came across? Um, yeah, being, yeah, in definitely. Your teens? Definitely. Because 
um, the Catholic school that I, you know, went to when I was growing up in the Philippines was like very conservative, like run by nuns. And then I went to middle school in Wilmington, Delaware, and it was like dirty, like there were cockroaches and like 13 year old girls like going home pregnant. And I was like, okay, this is new. (laughs) And, you know, I got to like pick my own outfits to her to school, which was like a big deal. (laughs) Yeah. So sure. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you find yourself in growing up? How did you find yourself in social justice work? Good question. Um, I feel it's really, I was just talking to someone about this the other day, how like when I moved from the Philippines, like I remember as a kid, like questioning a lot of what they taught us about Catholicism. Like Mm -hmm. I remember asking a ton of questions in school and like no one would want to be friends with me because they'd be like, you're asking such dumb questions. I'm like, I'm just trying to figure out how this white piece of bread becomes Jesus's body. Like, please answer my (laughs) questions. Like, let me know. Let me know what's up. Um, (laughs) But whenever we moved to the States, like the main source of community was really like through religious groups. Mm -hmm. Right. Because a a lot of Filipinos are very like gung ho Catholic. So like because we made friends that way, I was very much like okay like I'm gonna be as Catholic as possible like I really leaned in I was like a leader in my youth group like Mm -hmm. you know and then as I moved away from home as as I moved away from my family and it was like time for me to make my own community I was like like reading a lot of the (laughs) the Catholic texts that I was given I was like I don't believe in this like I don't care about this gotta go peace out (laughs) like you know yeah 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 did you run into any I guess because you're, you said your family is very Catholic, right? Mm-hmm. Were there any, like, issues growing up in that with when you started leaving the church? Is that the right term? Um, <laughs> I, honestly, yeah. I was not a good Christian. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I read Harry Potter, and then someone was just like, you're going to go to hell. And I was like, cool, I guess I'm going to hell <laughs> with Harry Potter. Yeah. My yeah. moment was, like, probably, like, 18 or 19. I was, like, living in Chicago for college. And, like, I remember going to this... Um, I don't know, it was like some event. And then they wanted me to give a speech about, uh, I mean, I feel like I've been a pretty decent like public speaker, you know, ever since I was younger. So I was like, okay, like I can read this and like figure it out. And so they would give you an outline and you would have to like give, you know, personal life (laughs) details or whatever. And something in the outline was like, you know, feminism is great, but like God intended the man to be the head of the household. So, like, if the woman is, like, the breadwinner, you still have to do things that make him feel like the head of the household. I was like, I don't agree with that. And also, like, I enjoy sucking dick, so, like, I'm just going to leave. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, I like the sexual part of it was also, like, there was a lot of policing of my body from, like, my family members, my community members, like, growing up. And, like, I also was getting fed up with with that. So, like, all that together was I was like... I got to go like a, like a door open. And I was like, it's time time to to run. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. I love that. You're just like, yeah, I enjoy sucking dick. Love it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Be unapologetic women about sucking dick Mm -hmm. or not, you know, or like, you know, the strap. Yeah. Either one. (laughs) (laughs) We're open. Of course. Yeah. Somebody said to me the other day, we're going to keep it fluid. Like our genders. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, yes, exactly. (laughs) Who was I talking? I swear, I was just having this conversation where I was just like, I just think everyone, everything's fluid and that's okay. Yeah. And why are people making such a big deal out of Mm -hmm. it? I'm just like, throughout history, it's been okay. And then suddenly it's like, no, it's just binary. You're either man or woman. Um, Yeah. That's it. So, (laughs) I don't know, guys. Just leave people alone. Just let people live. (laughs) For sure. For sure. I feel like that's like the theme of my podcast. (laughs) Let people live. Yeah. Um, So who are you bringing um, into the room today with your historical topic? Yeah. Um, I am bringing in Jose Rizal, who is, um, you know, he is lauded as a hero of the Philippines. Um, His writings really contributed to the start of the Philippine Revolution, which, you know, freed us from, I'm putting it in air quotes, freed... um, freed the Philippines from 333 years of Spanish colonization. Um, yeah. Um, what years were, was this? Um, let me. Oh yeah. Take your time. Yeah. No rush. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we were um, colonized by Spain from 1511 to 1898. Hmm. Um, and was this also, this was during the time of like the Philippine-American War, right? Um, the Philippine-American War happened like at the end of that. At the end of yeah. that, yeah. Um, yeah. So when he, when this guy, Jose, well, sorry, what's his last name? Rizal. <laughs> Rizal. <laughs> yeah. When he started the revolution, was that also in conjunction with the war? So there were already um, a bunch of different guerrilla groups that were doing the work, but Jose Rizal was actually born sort of upper middle class, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he and his family, like his family were um, landowners, I want to say, and they would lease out to farmers. Um, they had like, their family had like 11 children. Like Jose was one of 11 children. Um, and both of his parents were like highly educated and like his mom was very diligent about like educating her kids, like ever since they were younger. So like my whole thing is like, you know, he's like heralded as such a hero for like sort of like his thoughts and his words were sort of like the pinnacle of Philippine revolution. But like he wasn't actually the person like doing the groundwork. Um, I also like read somewhere very briefly that his brother, um, I cannot remember his name, but his, one of his brothers was like involved in the revolution, like from like starting from like his college, um, like his educational group had like, you know, mm -hmm. some revolutionary uprising, but like he wasn't physically like with them. Like, so then when he was in his twenties, like he traveled widely to like Europe and even to New York, like, you know, Oh wow! so like he was, wealthy and he got to like you know go to medical school and he was eventually like an ophthalmologist by trade mm -hmm. um so one of my things is like he's such a hero but he like the main thing is that he wrote all these things and then he came back to the philippines and they were like well you're gonna be in jail because you're writing against you know the government mm. um and that's like his main like legacy and i always think about like who who is able to do that work or like who has access or like who's not being honored or like given the credit for doing like the actual like bloodshed work, you know? So, right. yeah. So he, so even though he led this revolution, if I'm understanding this correctly, he was still sent to jail. I would not say leading. Well, I would even say, though he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He I would say he like ignited yeah. or yeah. influenced it. He, he still went to jail. Yeah. Yeah. And he was executed by, in like 1896, I believe, he was executed by the Philippine government for like writing all this propaganda. That's so interesting. Yeah. So even though he, his writing was against colonization mm -hmm. from Spanish rule. Like the, the Spaniards put him in jail. The Spaniards put him in jail, but then the Philippine government killed him? What do you mean? They were like one in the same. Oh. Right. Because they were still colonized. They were still colonized. Yeah. I always thought this was like post-colonization. No, 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 no. <laughs> and yeah. I was just like, why would they then kill the person who saved them, quote unquote? No, no, no. You know? yeah. So when did colonization end or did it ever end? A lot of people argue that it's still going on. So as I was like trying to do some research for this episode, I was like, there's a lot of like caca on the, <laughs> on the internet, you know, because yeah. I was reading all this stuff about like the Philippine-American War and like all these things like my my understanding especially you know my like knowledge of the history comes from some of the folks I'm in community with who teach a lot about the Philippines from like a, rev a revolutionary standpoint um so my understanding is that um and like maybe I'm wrong I don't know but like my understanding is that um the Spanish and the Americans were like having a having a little worldwide tiff it's casual and um, <laughs> and the Spaniards lost. So um, the U.S. actually won Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines in like you know some kind of a treaty. And then the the Spanish, from what I understand, the Spanish told the Americans like you know the Philippines has been colonized for like over three hundred years. Like they don't know how to be. So you have to make it seem like you're you know, trying to colonize their country in order for you to, like, occupy it and, like, use it as, like, a strategic, you know, like, Asian Air Force Base. You know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. like, my understanding is that there was a lot of, a lot more, like, shady shit going on. But <laughs> on the internet, even on Wikipedia, like, they didn't, like, 
it just seemed like, okay, like we broke free from the Spaniards and then the Americans came in and then like, you you know what I mean? Like it didn't seem like there's no autonomy given to the people who actually like fought in these revolutions. Um, And there's no sort of like humanity given to like, from what I heard, there were like battles that were staged. Yes. That makes sense. um, So in season one of this Mm -hmm. um, podcast, there was a guest who talked about the Philippine American war. Yeah. He did bring up that there were like, yeah staged battles and i was like that's weird (laughs) yeah but it's like can you imagine all the people that died because they wanted to stage a battle like that's fucking crazy yeah it's fucking insane (laughs) like yeah and my understanding from that episode was colonialism hasn't ended it has not depending on who you ask well there's still obviously like funneling like millions of dollars into the philippines and that goes into like carrying out this current president's sort of agenda of I feel like it's like a like an ethnic cleansing agenda you know um disguised as a war on drugs so Mm. yeah I mean it's really terrible actually yeah yeah um so does your family still live in the Philippines or I have extended family there um I have my immediate family here in the states yeah um so you don't visit do you visit this extended family often Not often, not often enough. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I feel I honestly don't feel confident enough to go home by myself. Like, you know, I think it's going to take me some time to feel like, okay, I can go there and I can like navigate. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I completely understand that. Um, I think in Taiwan, it's better better in terms of like, there's English all around. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just like, but when people see me, they are like, oh, you're definitely not Taiwanese, which is mm-hmm. a weird thing because I'm like, but look at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, you can get your water. You can also keep it in that area. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, so do you, do you personally feel like that is something you grapple with identity-wise, or is it just it just is? Um, I think like um, it took me a while to even like learn about colonialism or like even if I sort of like have known that that was a thing like if you just think about the way that American kids are taught about history like especially about like you know and then we went to this country and then now like that's our country like I don't think that anyone really knows like what the long lasting like generational effects of it are so um one of the things I think about all the time is like there's just no way for me to think about Filipino culture without like having it so heavily intertwined with American culture. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I feel like so much of the media that I consumed when I was younger was like American. And therefore I was like, I, I just want to be American. <laughs> and like, you know, when we moved to the States, like I, it never even crossed my mind to think like, oh yeah, I'm a a woman of color, I'm an immigrant, like I'm oppressed. (laughs) Like the the thinking is always like, you're so lucky you got here, like be grateful that you got here. And I feel like that's still like the aftermath of colonialism. You know what I mean? Like this this sort of like wherever you're, like this idea that like the finish line keeps moving, like, okay, like now you got to America, you thought that was the finish line? Like, like, you've been punked like it's so fucking expensive to live here good luck surviving <laughs> like it's so expensive right? i think that's we were talking about that on the car ride over we're just yeah. like how do we afford life <laughs> yeah and it's also like oh okay you thought you were like you know a big dog in the philippines you like owned a bunch of businesses like fuck that we don't understand your accent you're a janitor like you know what i mean like all of it is still like rooted in that one like original idea it's something that I think about a lot like sort of like that it's this one like tree with like a bunch of like it roots Mm -hmm. and it just like spreads everywhere and you can't that intergenerational drama yeah (laughs) that shit (laughs) uh yeah it's it is really hard to think about um and do you find that there is even for you personally or for the community that there is this hope for healing or 
what would that take? What would that even look like? Yeah, I mean, as someone who's doing community work, you just have to believe that there's hope <laughs> or else you're just going to lay down <laughs> and right. stop. Yeah, exactly. You know? So there's definitely hope, at least in that, even if it doesn't, you know, sort of give you financial mobility, like even if this community won't give you sort of, I don't know, a lot of tangible I don't know, deliverables, I guess, is something you could say. Like, oh, I just felt triggered. <laughs> deliverables. <laughs> Even if there's no, like, tangible deliverables, like, I think that this, like, idea that someone else close by thinks the same as you and it is, you know, in solidarity with you is, like, really powerful. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I have to believe that there's hope for, you know, this utopia that I'm building in my mind that <laughs> I hope that we can live in one day. So, Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of community work and social justice work is based off of um, love for humanity for sure. and, like, a deep empathy. Yeah. Um, because, like you said, if there were no hope, we would all just lay down like I did in 2016 <laughs> for a year straight. <laughs> I was just like, I cannot do anything. Life yeah. is over. Um, and I w will say, like, you know, even starting this podcast and meeting people like you who yeah. are like all building community has been so healing. And I didn't realize like how powerful it was to be with yeah. other women of color um, as well, because I've just been with, I don't know, tech bros, honestly. Oh my God, I'm so happy to hear that you're like, you know, yeah, this experience is healing too. Yeah, and I hope the book club has been too. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, something we were talking about too in the car is like, how do we, how do you do self care? Yeah. You know, because I'm sure there are our listeners who also want to do more work yeah. in the community, but it's it's hard. There are times where I want to blow up this podcast and be like, it's over, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, balance for sure um, is hard to achieve. Um, aside from book club, I'm part of, you know, another organization and I also have like my own creative ventures. And I think like listening to your body, <laughs> listening to your body is important. Um, meditation has been really important for me. Um, I also take really, really long walks, like through bed all the way to like Park Slope. It just like for shits and giggles. Um, and it, you know, it's really clears my mind yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I also if you follow me on Instagram you would know that I take a lot of bubble baths um yeah <laughs> baths are healing yeah yeah and I think like um when I feel may, I don't know if this is like a like an everybody thing maybe this is just me but like as someone who has been always someone who has always been told that they should either cover up or like be smaller like hyper visibility is like mm -hmm. excellent like I post so many selfies like yeah it's my lifeblood <laughs> yeah you were um in your bio you mentioned something about being proud of fatness and yeah. you want to speak a little bit more on that yeah because um, yeah. I think that's really important because I personally see so much just toxic body image issues on Instagram I mean because we were just talking yeah. about Instagram and I'm just like and like just so many new diets coming out and I'm just yeah. like that is really sad to me I don't I and I don't have like a good answer for it for sure I mean um I'm sure that everyone that listens to this podcast would agree that like capitalism was just like the root of all evil you know what I mean like yes, I think that everything that's going on in the diet industry right now just comes from like you're just feeding off of people's insecurities and you're like deepening them because then like the whole 30 doesn't give a fuck if you like eat clean for 30 days they don't give a fuck like they want you to fail so that you'll continue to buy like whatever like maybe you'll sign up for a group that like specializes in whole 30 and it's like you go there and you participate and they don't give a fuck if you put the weight back on you know what I mean like none of the stuff that they're doing is like sustainable like at whole 30 like i'm sure they're listening <laughs> you know <laughs> like and like gyms like gyms want you to fail like gyms want you to stop doing your workout routine so that you just keep paying your dues and like you know like and i think it's it's hard to it's hard to talk to people about like 
fatness, um, especially for people who are not willing to understand that it's like a really deep seated construct um, to work against people who are fat. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Yeah. And then again, so in June, actually, the books that the book that we're going to be reading, which we haven't selected yet, is going to be about uh, fat bodies specifically. Um, And then with my friend Daniele, who runs a blog called Girl Embolded, we are hosting like a fat, like a healing space for fat girls and women um, and, you know, non-binary people of color. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I think it should be a really fun experience. Um, I'm really hoping that folks come away from that particular event feeling like, okay, I'm really not alone. Like everyone goes through this. You know, it's not necessarily about like, okay, what are we going to do to take down the system? Like the first step is for everyone to be like, okay, like we all know we're here. We're going to acknowledge each other. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's almost as if a lot of people glorify, um, I don't even know how to say this without, yeah, I'm like trying to be diplomatic now because I don't want to sound harsh about this, but yeah, it's like they glorify these disordered eating habits for sure in order to mean to have this like whatever unattainable figure Mm -hmm. whereas if you just not just love yourself but like if we could dismantle the system in some way then that even yeah i mean it's interesting that you know the first thing you're like okay if we could like love ourselves i feel like yeah it's easy for the conversation to turn from you know, there's a systematic oppression of fat people that's going on to like, oh, like self love and like body positivity, mm-hmm. like all this stuff that I feel like is it's important, you know, but it's not all of the work. Um, I still feel like stopping at like self love is a little bit lazy, to be honest. And maybe that's just me because like to me, you know, I'm able to get there and now I'm like I'm trying to mobilize to get everyone to get there. Yeah. <laughs> um but I feel like the the work doesn't stop there. And then for someone to then, like, take, like, Ashley Graham, for example. Like, she was... Yeah, she was... <laughs> Sorry, I'm so no, bad No, she's at one of the first, like, plus yeah. size, like, models oh, on I the think scene. I... Yeah. But when she really blew up and she got all these, like, deals from, like, swimsuit companies and she was, like, on Sports Illustrated, blah, blah, blah. She, like, lost a bunch of weight. And mm. then now it's, like okay, like, you made money and fame off of, like, this community's back, and now you're, like, selling us fucking workout gear. Like, bitch, what is wrong with you? (laughs) Like, you know? That reminds me of, what do you feel, I mean, I have, like, no opinion, or I just feel like I'm so kind of, like, um, gender theory. I feel like I'm still learning. Yeah. And this is, like, a new part of the work that I'm learning, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Um, so I don't really know how to feel about, um, oh my God, what is her name? <laughs> she's on Instagram all the time. It's, she's on The Good Place, that British Jamila, one. Jamila, Jamila Jamil. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, because I see a lot of backlash with her and I'm just like, it seems like to me she's doing good work, but she's I don't. She's doing really good work. Yeah. So I don't, I just get really confused. I'm like, I don't know who to believe now. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the Kardashians also don't care about us. So, <laughs> um, yeah, she, she's been doing really great work in calling out these celebrities that promote this, like, detox tea that's literally right. just, like, a rebranded laxative. <laughs> yeah, and growing up, I remember, did you ever remember, drink the ballerina tea? No, but I Have did. Have heard of it? I did buy into, like, the Slim Fast shake situation i feel like that's like similar i don't know i don't did it make you sorry to be gross but like basically Definitely shit your you pants shit yourself <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah and i remember when i was a teenager my mom bought this ballerina tea and she was like it's you know for weight loss yeah and it felt like a scene in alien <laughs> in the middle of the <laughs> night where i was just like i don't know what's going on but that's so crazy and it's only now that i'm thinking about like yeah that was crazy thing and i if i bought into that i would have really been really unhealthy um thankfully i just really love food and i don't care (laughs) but yeah 
not a lot of people get there. So um, I'm glad that people like her are calling it out. But then I was seeing all this backlash against her. So I'm like, I don't get it. Well, because the Kardashians went on the New York Times and were like, oh, she's just a hater. Like, you know, if she got opportunities like this, it's easy money. And she fired back and she was like, yeah, I do get opportunities like this, but I'm smart enough to say no because, like, my audience is a bunch of women. <laughs> like, especially, like, the Kardashians, their audience is a bunch of, like, teenagers. Mm, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they're very impressionable. They, like, don't know what's up yet. Yeah. Like, they're just going to say, like, oh, the Kardashians are endorsing this, but add to cart. You know what I mean? Like, it's... Yeah. So what is... The, you were mentioning that self-love is obviously... a just like the surface of the work what is um if you don't mind me asking what is the rest of the work in your opinion um the rest of the work in my opinion um I mean maybe this is a little bit radical or like out there but honestly like I have a lot of radical crazy people (laughs) who are in positions of privilege just need to give up space um you know what I mean like I think there's a lot of talk about like privilege is so hard to deconstruct because people aren't willing to let go of like the comfort that you know all these different things that they've been afforded but you know people just like in the same vein that I like for example I've you know been approached by a couple different like publications or like different groups that are like hey do you want to speak at this thing and I like will always say like I will kind of you know do a little deep like google search on who they are and I'm like okay if you're cause is going to champion like black women specifically like I don't feel comfortable like being the one but I can recommend you to like all these other people in the community right so in the same way that you're like passing the mic in that sense like same kind of like I the people who design plus size clothing are not always plus size and that's an issue right like Mm -hmm. the people who are in the plus size clothing industry and aren't plus size need to frankly just give up space like you know like I feel like that's the work but obviously that's really hard work (laughs) yeah definitely and it's and do you feel like as a leader of this of this book club that have you felt any I'm like I guess this burden of responsibility I don't know if that's the right word all the time yeah and I feel like you know it became easier to grapple with once I became vocal about like I'm not necessarily a gatekeeper like I'm just learning with (laughs) y'all like so I try my best to be like transparent about all that stuff and even if there are certain decisions that are like you know, publicity for book club or something. Like, I'll actually, like, talk to folks and be like, how do you feel about this? Like, do you feel like that's shady? Or, like, what do you think? You know, like, so yeah. it's definitely a communal thing. And um, I don't think anyone, I don't, not one person knows everything. So also just having the humility to, like, step back when you know it's not really your forte. <laughs> yeah definitely yeah like I will be the first to admit I don't know anything (laughs) I'm I'm a dumb person (laughs) you're not a dumb person but I'm learning you know Um, you're not dumb no I'm I know I'm not dumb I'm super that's my friend you're talking about (laughs) oh my god it's so nice (laughs) but you what yeah but what I was trying to say in a deflective terrible (laughs) jokey way I'm sorry um, (laughs) was that I think sometimes people look up to I don't know, people in media or just yeah. like people on Instagram, they're like, you should have all the answers. And quite frankly, I started this podcast because I don't know a lot yeah. of the answers. Yeah. And I, I want to learn them. Um, yeah. No, I feel like I'm very, even if someone asks like a difficult question at book club or like something like factual, I'm like, okay, I'll look into that. I'll get back to you. <laughs> like I yeah. won't, <laughs> you know, I can't, I think that there is something about like cancel culture that's going on on Instagram where like someone is either like your fucking hero or like they're canceled. (laughs) Like If they do one (laughs) thing that's wrong, they're canceled. And it doesn't seem that there is sort of a gray area. Um, And it almost is like there's entertainment value and like seeing someone get dragged online. So I feel like people really like gravitate to that shit. And I, you know, I don't know. Like I feel like, 
it's important to note that there are still like human beings behind the screens that are being operated. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, and no one's perfect. Like no one is going to get everything a hundred percent. Right. So right. like, it's important to make that distinction and eat, like in person, I'm very like open about that. And I'm very open about being like, Hey, like I was really scared to take up space in this one like situation. What do you think? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, so I don't know. Yeah. And speaking of no one being perfect, how have, I mean, because the book love is exclusively for women of color and people who identify as women of color, um, how has it been grappling with, like, if there are people who are just like, I feel excluded because, you know, it's reverse racism or some crazy thing? Or have there been any moments where you felt like there are allies and like how do you find good allies in that regard um (laughs) i feel like i just threw a lot at you i feel like that was two questions no no no, it's fine there have been a a couple people that are like can i come like i have my i'm the only white person in my family like i married a black guy (laughs) like stuff like that and i'm just like i'll just leave them on red like no i'm not gonna (laughs) entertain your shit like you know what i mean um i don't know i would like to see a white person try to come to to book club (laughs) like i'd like to see you try but you know i do have um some folks who are like i'm you know i'm white passing or like i'm half half white and like very light-skinned like do you think i'm still welcome and i'm like yeah like you know if you and like yeah i'm like yeah definitely come but also like recognize who the space is for like for reading a book that's about you know like in january we read um here comes the sun by nicole dennis ben which was like set in jamaica and you know like if we're reading that book and you're white like obviously you're not going to (laughs) be the person taking up the most space in this discussion right yeah so and thank you for gifting me that book of course it was so nice. I don't, I read it, but I didn't come to book club because no, of fine. this podcast. <laughs> yeah. But Did I did like it. I loved it. It was so yeah, good, right? It was so, I cried. I, I cry yeah. on like a lot of books. Me too. I'm so like emotional and I feel like people in, people in book club are like, oh, you cried. Yeah, <laughs> like, I cry all the time. Like um, most recently I read um, T. Kara Madden's memoir, um, Long Live the Tribe of the Fatherless Girls. I was like just sobbing on the subway and I was like, oh my Mm -hmm. gosh, this is so sad. But so beautifully written. But a lot of people are just like, why? It's just a book. But it feels more than that. I mean, I feel like anyone who has written a book has, you know, made a significant personal offering to the world. So Mm -hmm. anytime I'm like reading it, I'm like, oh my God. Like, yeah. 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 Um, sorry to get off track, but you were saying that there are, there have been people who are just like, I'm white passing or I'm mm-hmm. an ally or something. Like yeah. That nature. Yeah. There's even like, um, I don't think that a lot of, like, I don't think that Middle Eastern folks are like welcome to join functions that are for like people of color, which like some of that is understandable, but also their experiences are so othered that I did like, I felt like they needed to be included to give sort of like a well-rounded like representation of, you know, like not, not just representation, but really to like also hear their mm-hmm. point of view, points of view and like their stories. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the second question of the crazy big one I threw at you was um, how do you find good allies? Has that been difficult? <laughs> um, I'm really not sure yet. Yeah. I saw this like meme or like something like a blurb on Instagram that was like, like if there's like 10,000 snakes and you know, 300 of them aren't poisonous. Do you let in 300 of them like chancing that they're not poisonous? (laughs) And I was like, I really don't know the answer to that question. (laughs) Like, you know, like, and I love how, sorry, I like immediately (laughs) thought of Taylor Swift. I was just like, wow, (laughs) like Taylor Swift. How we started this yeah, whole conversation. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know either. I it's been because I think wokeness has been so trendy, it's hard for me to Yeah. No. And you know, like who gets to measure like the how good an ally is, you know what I mean? Like yeah. or like what does that look like? 
you know is it in terms of like what you're again like the privilege that you're giving up or is it terms of your ability to like hold space and like you know like like you know pass the mic or help other folks like build like the seat the seat at the table the a seat at the table like that bs is like i'm done with that so it's like now that we're building our own tables so to speak like a good ally to me would be like someone that helps you accomplish that either through money or access or space um or carpentry yeah yeah (laughs) building tables yeah it's it's hard for me to know because like i i feel like like we were talking about before i feel like i make a lot of mistakes and i Mm -hmm. like i just said i was just like yeah i i'm learning so like i don't it's hard for me to like measure a good ally you know, and it's and I feel like now the culture is just a lot of shouting on Twitter, which <laughs> I'm even sick of a lot of the activists that are social justice oriented that I followed before. And now I'm just like, OK, can you just stop shouting for a second? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't know either. I just yeah. feel like I just see a lot of articles just, that are like 10 ways to be a good ally. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, I don't know. I feel like I feel as if like as long as you're trying your best and you're open to new ideas that there's potential. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go, allies. (laughs) Just be open. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Are there any other um, stories about um, (laughs) Filipino? Filipino um, <laughs> colonization. <laughs> I don't know, man. We got so off topic. <laughs> no, no worries. Okay. Um, but if you wanted to share yeah, more, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm definitely open to it. And this is the magic of editing. It yeah. Go yeah. So um, many places. No, I guess one of the things that made Jose Rosal like the person for me to bring in was, you know, he was really, he wrote. Um, Nali Matangare and sorry, I don't think I pronounced that right. Nali Matangare. I, I don't know. And you could have said anything, no, and right? I'd be like, "Yeah, totally." <laughs> um, I am sorry in advance for every Filipino person listening to this. And he, okay, so he wrote um, Nali Matangare and El Filibusterismo, which is like two of the. I mean, like. I feel like that's like what they call the seed of like, you know, Fili- Filipino literature. Um, but yeah, he was really held up as this revolutionary writer. Um, but again, like he, like who has access to that? Like, right. Like the farmers and the workers who really were like um, in the revolution did not necessarily like, they probably, you know, not everybody was educated. Not everybody had the ability to read his work, right? Um, so there's always this question for me about, like, access and, like, like what the work even is or, like, what your role is within, like, right. <laughs> the work. Um, yeah. Do you think there needs to be a lot of change in even our education system? Sorry, I burped in the middle <laughs> of my sentence. <laughs> um, I think... I think that something I think about a lot is like, you know, like, okay, like I gather a bunch of women in my neighborhood and we like talk about books. Like, are we doing enough? Right. And I think that because there isn't like a, okay, like we're reading all these books and then we're going to show up to a rally and really fuck shit up. You know what I mean? Like like, um, decolonize this place. Do you follow them? I feel like I do. (laughs) They're like the group that goes to museums and they like set off. I don't think it's smoke bombs. I don't know what they're setting off. There's smoke involved in a lot of like, we're taking over the Whitney and that sort of things where I'm just like, wow, I didn't even know that was going on, (laughs) you know, in the Whitney because I'm so not attuned to like what's going on in museums. Yeah. Yeah. But I think about all the time, like everyone's like different roles. (laughs) <laughs> like, you know, like I um, don't necessarily think I'm someone who is like, OK, we're going to go to this protest and it might get violent. Like I like I don't feel like I have the teeth for it, to be honest, like I'll support. But I feel very like afraid of that work. And, you know, I feel like there are folks who work a nine to five and can't necessarily like make it out to those actions. Um, so I always think about like 
whatever you're doing in social justice justice work should also sort of like represent like what your skills and talents are and like then you apply it but then there's also this I always think about like is book club accessible to everyone like poor people disabled people you know like yeah um, I do see that you guys do a lot of give I say you guys have the book club is like a million people but you <laughs> yeah you do yeah. a lot of giveaways as well for books and like yeah um so that is a good way for access yeah yeah the I had someone ask me the other day like where do you get that I'm like Amazon <laughs> like you know <laughs> like from, I buy it myself and I give it to people like you know yeah. I think it's really important to have everyone be able to participate yeah and there's also like a lot of exhaustion that comes with the work too and you also have to take care of yourself because I feel like in 2016, the year that I laid down. <laughs> <laughs> the year that she yeah. laid down. That could be a good essay title. <laughs> um, yeah. That was kind of when I was just like, yeah, I don't think I can go to protests anymore. Um, only because I felt so disillusioned by the the women's march and the pink hats, pink pussy hats. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I, I don't know. There was just something about it. And obviously, I think there is like some good in in that. Um, but there was something about it that I was just like, I don't think this is for me. <laughs> yeah. And it felt like I felt bad saying yeah. that, you know, in that year. And I was just... Don't you think it's like once you kind of see like what goes into it and you're like, oh, I don't know if I'd be good at this. You'd like feel guilty that you might not right. be good at it. Right, exactly. It's like, how do you have imposter syndrome for, like, this kind of work? Like, that's wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think even doing this podcast is just like, oh, should I? Is is this the right thing? You're like, is this enough? No, you're very yeah. good at this. <laughs> thank you. Just like, I think you're really good at the book club. Oh, and I'm thank like, you. I think it's enough. Um, and I can only see it growing more and more from here because you were saying that like a lot of publications reach out to you not always with the best intentions yeah. but <laughs> and I totally understand that being a writer too for similar publications yeah. <laughs> I feel like I can't name them but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I understand this like everyone wants to sort of ride that teen vogue trend for sure <laughs> <laughs> for sure and like you know now the um like as a writer also like there's the work that I'm doing that like generates money and then there's the work that I'm like okay I'm really trying to make sure everyone hears this <laughs> like let me just slip this onto you you know mm-hmm. so yeah is there anything as we're wrapping up is there anything from this story or your personal story or just book club in general that you really want listeners to take away um definitely definitely talk to your neighbors um if there was one takeaway i think that would be it um and you know just don't be afraid to let your guard down in terms of not knowing everything (laughs) um i think maybe the best maybe the best kind of ally is an ally who's like always open to get like every truth they know like just torn apart um maybe that's maybe that's what it is <laughs> yeah yeah and that happens and to know that that happens to the best of us like yeah. i don't know if i told this when we met at the cafe when i found out that there was like a whole like um when the chinese nationalists went to taiwan they like also killed thousands upon thousands of people and like growing up it was just like the nationalists were great. Chiang Kai-shek is a god. And I was like, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Because you just grow up in that and you're like, yeah, he was like Obama. We love him. <laughs> and yeah, when I found that out, I was like kind of shook. I was like, oh my God. Like, And these are things my parents like are just like, that's propaganda. That's not real. I'm like, yikes. Yeah. They say, um, I went to St. Thomas not too long ago. My Grandmother used to live there and her best friend still lives there. Um, 
and I was talking to him about so like Duterte has all these. Do you know about this? I don't know. Yeah. A lot so about he it. he um, there are these laws in the Philippines that if you are suspected to be on drugs or like connected to drug crimes, like you could be shot on the street, and then somebody will write like drug dealer on your like on like a piece of paper and like put it down and it's like fine like no one gets punished like it's just like a thing that they do (laughs) okay like yeah and this is like trump heard about this and was like yeah that's brilliant (laughs) you know what i mean like (laughs) it's bad all around okay like so the reason i'm laughing is because i could see trump (laughs) saying like that's brilliant (laughs) yeah just in a (laughs) <laughs> right yeah. I mean I don't mean to be insensitive I'm like laughing because I feel like there's no like it's like the defense mechanism it, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah I feel so I feel so helpless about it that there's nothing I can do but like <laughs> you know <laughs> but like yeah people are no literally idea. like dying I mean the number is not, you can't even obviously they're covering up what the actual like body count is you know but I was like telling him this and I was like don't you think like you know these this like war on drugs that they're having in the Philippines. Like it's like affecting poor people more than anybody else. Like somebody could just be mentally ill, like walking down the street and like, I don't know. And he was like, he was like, but don't you think like it's made the country safer? Like what, what are you talking about? (laughs) I was like, excuse me. (laughs) Uh, Safer from poor people. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's, yeah, families also just say mm-hmm. things, and you're like, "What?" Yeah, how? but I hear I hear you though, and how they're like, "That's just propaganda." It's like, yeah, my mom hung up on me that day. It was like a very dramatic conversation, and I actually read it in a book. It was like a fiction book, mm-hmm. but like the backstory was historical. Yeah. Um, so even when I when I read it, I was like, "Wait, I can't believe this happened." <laughs> um, yeah, you know, because it also covered how the government at the time would kind of uh, murder random, not random, activists who were speaking yeah. out against this um, even in the 80s. And I was just, holy crap, I had no idea. And of course I called my mom and I was just like, did you know that yeah. this happened? And she got so angry at me and she was just like, I can't believe you're buying into that American propaganda. It wasn't oh that God. bad. <laughs> it wasn't that bad? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, but Chiang Kai-shek also tortured like, you know, the high up people, like the scholars and the lawyers, mm-hmm. so he could take over this island because people lived here. Yeah. And he was just like, this is mine now because I lost the other war. Um, <laughs> yeah, because Mao Zedong was horrible, too. And like, and I think that's like the context my parents are coming from. They're just like, well, the communists killed billions and millions of yeah. people. And your grandfather fled to Vietnam and then got captured and almost went blind. You know, so that's like the story, but but I'm like, yeah. oh, you shouldn't do that to another group of people in yeah. Taiwan. But I'm not allowed to say that. Even now, if I bring that up, they'll yell at me. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that we talked about at book club last time, we read um, the book of Unknown Americans, and there was like a really heated discussion about like, like the book talks about. Um, a Mexican family who had come to the U S to Delaware actually, um, which is really funny to me. Um, but they came to Delaware to like, um, their, this family's kid had like suffered a brain injury. So they came to Delaware and like the dad was working at like a mushroom factory and then loses his job. So they need to, he needs to get a new job in like 30 days in order to remain within status. And like, it was really difficult. And then, a lot of like tragic things happen, right? Mm. And so there was like a question at the end, like, you know, is someone gonna say it, like, is one of the characters in this book gonna say, like, is all of that worth it? <laughs> like, is all of that worth it to like be here in this country? And it was, it was a little bit like, there was, you know, I wasn't like wild, but there was a, like a couple like back and forth just being like, you know, what exactly is back, back there? Like, what do we have back there? Like, yeah, like, Sure, mm-hmm. like, there's, you know, home and, like, memories of home, but, like, financially speaking, you can't necessarily, like, survive. <laughs> so it's, like, I, and I was I was talking to, I was, like, I was thinking about that. I was, like, if I ever asked my parents this, I would get shot. Like, I would, you know, like, yes. there's just stuff you can't ask yeah, your parents. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I just push their buttons. I'm just, like, always doing that. But 
Yeah, I'm like, yeah. I already have too many things against me. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm gay. I don't go to church. I didn't become a doctor. Like, I can't bring up one more thing to my parents. God you know what I mean? It. You didn't become a doctor like every good <laughs> Filipino should. <laughs> I didn't become a nurse. My bad. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't do any of those things either. It's only recently my parents sort of are just like, yeah, she she wants to be a writer. That's because I she, she's um, they're just like she's just gonna keep crying at every office job <laughs> she gets. <laughs> they're just like okay you've cried enough <laughs> like yeah. just go write your book and I'm like okay now I don't know what to write about <laughs> <laughs> yeah um are there any um any personal um plugs that you want to shout out like any events coming up I know you've had one in June that's yeah up. yeah um so in June we are hosting a healing space specifically for fat women and femmes of color um what else in july we're working on i'm working with um my friend veronica um and we are the theme is going to be around like healing as well so like summer is all about healing. getting in your drake feelings like very tender <laughs> <laughs> wait but do we like drake for texting mvv millie bobby brown <laughs> Um, you know, I don't know. I'm so sorry. I just use Drake as a blanket term for people who have a lot of feelings. I mean, I don't know. I still, it's catchy. And I'm like, what were you doing, man? Don't text the 12 year old girl. I think that's how old she was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I get it. The summer of healing. Mm -hmm. I'm all about that. I did one yeah. last year, last summer, which is basically doing yoga every day and crying and <laughs> journaling my feelings well that's self-care yeah, right? exactly um where can people find you and your social media yeah. handles um your work and your writing yeah. so um uh <laughs> you bedside book club mostly lives on instagram um so at bedside book club and we also have a website that has a local directory featuring you know businesses owned by people of color um, what else? You can find all of my thoughts on stoner culture on www.twogirlsonecoven.com. Um, yeah. And you can follow my personal Instagram for very many thirst traps. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining me today. Of course. This was Thank a you for lovely having me. conversation. I'm so glad. I hope I sound, <laughs> you know somewhat intelligent you do i was gonna say you have such a soothing voice do man. i you really really do wow in a good way like a oh wow me. beatrice do you think about the underwear that you wear and how it affects your health your Actually, vaginal health <laughs> all the time really mm -hmm. what, what do you what do you do to take care of Sorry, this is like getting so TMI. <laughs> what what kind of underwear do you wear? Do you think about like... I how... think about how long I've owned the underwear and I'm like, can't be clean after like a certain point. You know what right. I mean? Like no matter how many times you wash it. Or like the material, how it affects yeah. you in that way. Well, <laughs> you can get for optimum <laughs> vaginal health <laughs> or just comfort. Dylan Underwear. Um, so Dylan Underwear is a panty made to empower women. Dylan is completely seamless and comfortable and is made to have you feel confident and sexy all day long. Made locally in New York by women for women. New styles are coming out this April. Um, sign up for the newsletter at DylanUnderwear.com and make sure to follow us on Instagram at Dylan underscore underwear for live updates. And we've just received the promo code, which is now in color, and you can get 10% off your Dylan underwear. Oh, shit. Yes. And it's owned and made and produced by a woman of color. Oh, my Yay. God. How awesome. <laughs> Yay. Go Dylan. Yeah. yeah. So like that. I'm going to throw away all of my underwear and buy, buy some from her. Yes. Buy some from Dylan. Yeah. She makes it all. She was telling me she like made the first batch like all in her apartment and i'm just like yes i'll totally support you in your underwear 100%. dreams and she's all about educating women about their health 
our vaginal health. <laughs> yeah, can I come to yeah. her TED talk? <laughs> yeah, she's great. Um, so check out Dylan Underwear, guys. Yay! Yay! <laughs> and that's.